could just feel it in my mind that he was telling me to do that. Take your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 2, if you would. <clears throat> yep, I don't know what's going on with it, but you're just going to have to read your Bible. There it is. Oh, there it is. It's like us. We get slow with age. It's like we're like computers. You buy a brand new computer and it works lightning fast. Now, if you have it for a couple years, what happens to it? Yeah, it's because all those stupid Windows updates and uh, all those screensavers that you got conned into downloading, which were nothing but malware. malware, spyware, viruses, you know, like the spyware that was in the Dominion voting machines. They actually did. The military went to Germany to confiscate the Dominion voting servers. Why was our election count being held on computers in Germany? Why is it not being reported on the mainstream? They don't want to say a word about it, but it happened. It happened. It's the truth. It happened. So military went in and confiscated those computers, and we have them now. I, well, we, not us here. Yeah, it was a coup. And that's called sedition and treason, and that's punishable by hanging or firing squad. It really is. That's, that's, still, that's still a law. It's, it's punishable by death. Yep. So anyway, uh, let me see if I can connect this real quick for your benefit. Connections. This one. Ah, ain't going to work. Ain't going to work. All right. Revelation chapter 2. Let's start verse 1. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, he said, I know thy works. This is Jesus now talking. If you have a red letter Bible, it's in red letters. It says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. And hast borne and hast means you've carried burdens and hast patience. You carried the burdens of being a Christian and living a Christian life, you carried that with patience. What, what brings, according to the Bible, what brings patience? Trial of your faith worketh patience. Tribulation worketh patience. Okay? So, the things that we go through in life that are not good, they are there to teach us patience. They're there to teach us what God has always tried to teach us, and that is trust Him and wait on Him. I've been dealing um, and doing a lot of research, Watchman video broadcasts coming out, the one that came out last week, week before that, and this week, dealing with false prophets. And the false prophets will tell you, you must act, you must do, God's waiting on you to, to test your faith, so you must do something in order to get God to do what you want. And that's not true. The Bible says, wait on the Lord. When Jesus left the disciples there in Jerusalem before he ascended up in heaven, what did he tell them? Wait. He told them to wait. And I've seen this with my own eyes. When, when we pastored down in Washington County, down in Richwoods, there's a lot of little bitty charismatic churches in just about every holler in that county. And some of them are whew, wacky. And my deacon told me that he got invited to a service and he pulls up there and there's people running around the outside of the church. And he at, he's going, what are they doing? And uh, he said, they're running in the Holy Spirit. 
that's just as serious as they could be. They have to run around the church to get him in. And I'm going, that ain't how it works. Here's what Paul said in Galatians. Because he, he asked the Galatian churches, did you receive the Spirit by the work of the law or by the hearing of faith? They received the Holy Spirit by they heard the Word of God and they received it because they believed what God said and they waited. So, and I've, see, I've been watching videos this week of some of these loony churches and people running around the, the auditorium, running circles around the auditorium saying they're bringing the Holy Ghost in. And I'm going, he doesn't come in that way. You don't make a... If that's the case, he's in every toilet. When you flush it, it makes a whirl. And you, okay? But Jesus told the disciples to wait on the Holy Ghost. And they did. They sat there and they prayed and they waited. And God showed up when God was good and ready to show up. But God's timing is always perfect. It just so happened, it wasn't by accident, that he showed up on a feast day, the Feast of Pentecost. It was uh, the Feast of Weeks, 50 days after the Passover. So anyway, that's what he's saying in verse 3. Is that thou hast born and hast patience for my name's sake, hast labored and hast not fainted. Um, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now, last Sunday, there was just one place I wanted to look at. Uh, left over from last week where he talks about not feigning. In other words, not giving up and not quitting. Uh, first, 2 Timothy chapter 4, you can turn to these places, 2 Peter chapter 2. But let me tell you about a man by the name of Demas. D-E-M-A-S, not demon, Demas. Demas was one of Paul's evangelism companions. And Paul would travel from place to place. Demas was with him. And he would help Paul's ministry. We don't know exactly what he did. But he would help Paul. And he was with Luke. And heard Paul preach from city to city. And Paul spoke well of him. But then, 2 Timothy is the last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. Because it's, it's not the last one in your Bible. But it's the last one he wrote. Because he tells Timothy, my time is at hand. They're fixing to chop his head off. He's in, he's in Rome. He's in, under house arrest. He's not in a prison, but he's under house arrest. And he's going to be killed for the crime of preaching the gospel. And so he says in 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. What happened to Demas? Demas is a lot like a lot of other people that I've seen in my life. They play church. They play it well. But then, and God already knows this, all that time they loved the world, which means they loved their sin. They loved their sin and they loved the pleasures of this world more than they loved God. And God knew it. And there came a time, and this is biblical, in the parable of the seed and the sower, Jesus talked about this, the seed that's sown on stony ground, it'll sprout up and it'll endure for a while. But when the sun comes out and there's no rain, and that, whatever plant that was, has no root in it, it can't get water, and that represents the hardness of some people's hearts. They just things they won't believe, and they love this present world because it has no root. It withers up, and if it withers up, it's cast off, bears no fruit, not going to heaven. And so that's what happened to Demas. Demas left Paul, forsook him, having loved this present world. It wasn't that he went to some other ministry. He just quit altogether and went back to his old sins. Now, turn to 2 Peter 2. What happens when a person, and I think this correlates with Hebrews 6 and the parable of the seed and the sower, but what happens when a person goes back to the old sin? 
I had a friend in college. We sang together in a, in a gospel group. Uh, he was a few years older than me, but we were best friends in college, and I never knew this about him, but I was told this after I left the college. Um, after I left, and we didn't see each other for, I haven't seen him since, I was told that, and he used to tell me all the time about the drugs that him and his brother took, and that, like, we'd, we'd go out to a buffet or something like that and eat and just stuff ourselves, and he'd say, oh, I'd give anything for a, a, a drink right now, and a cigarette, and a joint, and so I found out that he had got into a relationship with a man. I didn't know that about him. But it dawned on me, I used to hear him talk all the time about all the things that he used to do, all the parties he did, all the drugs he did. He used to tell me their effects. And I could tell that it was in him, that he wanted to go back. And to this day, He's still a sodomite. He loved, this, he loved the sin, and he decided to leave, and he was training. He went to that college to train to be a minister. He was going to be a preacher. But he loved his sin too much, and he went back to it. And to this day, he's not come back. He's still alive, last I heard. So 2 Peter chapter 2, here's what happens. You ever seen a dog lick vomit? Ugh. Let's look at verse 19. While they promised them liberty, they them talking about, he's talking about the false prophets of this world. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. Four. If after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein. I've been studying that too, the law of entanglement. It's in quantum physics called quantum entanglement, but it's also in the Eastern Hindu and Buddhist religions that everything is connected. Everybody is connected and you are connected to that asphalt out there on the parking lot. You and the trees and all the air and all the stars, we're all one. We're all entangled together. And it says, for if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than, than the beginning. Now think about that statement. When you're born again, which is better, your first birth or your second birth? Second one. Which is better, the, the old heaven and earth or the new heaven and earth? New, which is better, the Old Testament or the New Testament? New one. The New Testament is better than the Old Testament. New Testament says you're saved by faith. Old Testament says you're saved by works. And we didn't work. We can't. So in this case, your latter end is not going to be better than your beginning. Your latter end is going to be worse than your beginning. For it hath been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. And that's what happens. Now, every one of us has the draw of our old sins. Every one of us. But something happens with some people who just decide, I ain't going to fight it no more. I'm just going to go back to it and stay that way. And God says the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So Jesus commends back to... Uh, Revelation 2, Jesus commends the church for not fainting. 
Not giving up, not quitting, even though it got tough, it got hard. We're not quitting. Um, and you haven't, you, you won't hear it on CBS, CNN, MSNBC. You will not hear the Trump lawsuits that are going on, but he's winning them. And you don't hear this on the main, they don't want you to know this. That's right. But he still has every possibility of retaining the presidency. He still has it. Okay? That's why he hasn't quit. He's still got something worth fighting for. And don't we all, somebody say amen? Heaven is not something that I want to lose. Hell is not someplace I want to go. Ever. And I don't care what it takes or what I lose on this earth. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to do it. Now, Revelation, uh, Revelation 2.6. He says, This thou hast, and Jesus, this Jesus talking to the church at Ephesus, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, look, same chapter, look at verse 15. This is the church at Pergamos, and the church at Pergamos, Jesus mentions this in verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Twice now, in the same chapter, to two different churches, Jesus said, Number one, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Number two, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now for God, Jesus, to say, I hate these people, it's a serious thing. Because that's what he said. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And he said, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Well, who are the Nicolaitans? Are they the Baptists? Are they the Pentecostal? Are they the Methodist? Who are they? Okay, let's break the word down. Nico means to conquer or to like be the, be the ruler over. That's what Nico means. Somebody named Nicholas is named, the word Nico means like a king. It's a, I think it's a Greek word, but it means a king or someone who is the boss over somebody. Laity. What is that? It's the people sitting in the pews. So, put the two words together. The boss over the church pew people. And think about what that means. Am I any different than anybody else in this church? No. Am I better than anybody here? No. Um, am I the smartest guy in the room? No. In religion, across the board, doesn't matter what religion it is, the deeds and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans reigns. Because whoever the priest, the witch doctor, the voodoo man, the medicine man, the prophet, the Pope, the Bishop, the Imam, or whoever. They are the ones who have the, the say over everybody's life. And there, I, there are some preachers that think that they have to rule over everybody in their church's life. They rule and they decide everything for them. There, and there are even training courses that train pastors how to basically boss everybody in their church. That if, there's, if somebody in the church wants to get married, that has to meet the approval. The pastor has to prove it. Pastor has to say, well, I don't, I, think these, I don't think that person's right for you. And if that pastor says it and that guy marries that, that gal, they throw him out. Okay? He dictates what kind of food they eat, whether or not they're allowed to have a television, what they wear, everything. He rules over everything. And Jesus said, 
that he hated the deeds and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And it's found in a lot, a lot of churches. So let's say, um, let me read. Well, I wish I had my screen. I'm featuring this this week in the Watchman broadcast. And I mentioned this Wednesday night. I'm going to bring it up again because it really, it, it proves what I'm saying. If you're a Roman Catholic, do you have, a, do you have the right, according to the Catholic faith, do you have a right to interpret the Bible? No. You have absolutely no right. In fact, they don't really want you reading it. They especially don't want you reading a King James. So they came up with their own, and they have different vernacular translations of the Bible. They're very twisted. But they don't, here's, here's what it's called. It's called the Magisterium. There is a council in the Vatican right now called the Magisterium. And here's what their job is. The popes and bishops in union with the Pope, are successors of the apostles and inherit the responsibility of authoritative teaching from them. We call this teaching office the magisterium. The task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. Interpretation of Scripture is ultimately subject to the judgment of the magisterium which exercises the divine commission to hold fast to and to interpret authoritatively God's word. Now, here's, here's what I'll ask. And you, it's okay for you to raise your hand. Who in here has ever disagreed with me on anything I've ever preached on? I'll raise my hand. My own mom raised her hand. I'll deal with you later. Yeah. Yeah, she does. And you know what? And I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. You have just as much right to read and to think things about this Bible for yourself. Amen. I call it the Second Amendment of Christianity. Amen. Do we not have a right to use firearms to defend our homes, our property, and our liberty? Do we not have that right? That's right. And that right is not given to us by government. The Second Amendment does not say that. Second Amendment says the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed because it recognizes that God gave us the right to do that. God did. Chris Pinto has a new video out. I'm about halfway through it. And when I watch the whole thing of it, I'm pretty sure I'm going to recommend it to everybody because it is dead on, right on true. He's gone into the Puritan beginnings of our country, not George Washington and Ben Franklin, further back from that. And I've done a study very similar to this, and he's dead on. Those men knew that a Christian's ability to bear a Bible in one hand and a sword in the other was given to them by God. Okay? So, you have as much right and responsibility to defend the faith of this book as I or anybody else. I'll tell you a story. This is in 1 Samuel 13. The Philistines would not allow the Israelites to have a blacksmith anywhere in the land of the Israelites for one reason. So they couldn't make swords or spears or any kind of weapons. The Philistines said... If a war breaks out, we don't want to be fighting the Jews at all. So we're not going to let them have a blacksmith. And if any of the Jews, if they had to sharpen their axe or their plow or anything like that, they had to go to the Philistines and have it done for them. The only people of the Israelites who were allowed to have a sword was Saul and Jonathan. That was the government. Think about it. If the government in this country was the only one who had weapons and we the people didn't have them, do you think we would still be a constitutional republic this day? Absolutely not. Which is why Biden and all those K 
characters want to take our guns away from us. Now, take that and apply it biblically. The church pew member has just as much right to read and know the Bible as I do. Now, the interpretation of the Bible belongs to God. There's to be no private interpretation. That means that if you don't understand something from 2 Peter, read something from John or Isaiah or Psalms or Genesis or someplace else. The Bible says, let the spiritual things compare to the spiritual things. Isaiah 28, it's line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. The Bible interprets the Bible. Amen? So, but I don't know everything in the Bible. So sometimes I, I see things and I might see it a certain way. You see it another way. But I think we're all okay that Jesus is God. Amen? Salvation is by grace through faith. Amen? And the Bible is never wrong. Amen? So outside of that, I'm cool. You can disagree with me if you want. But you can't disagree with this book. Period. But that's not what the magisterium says. The magisterium of the Catholic Church says you can't disagree with them on anything. So you still have faithful Catholics who don't eat chicken, pork, or beef on Friday. What do they eat? Why is that not meat? Yes, ma'am. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's whatever the popes and their tradition tells her to do, she does it. That's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It says that the clergymen have the right to rule over the people in the pew and that you don't have a right on your own to read and know what this Bible says. And for 1,500 years, the Catholic Church wouldn't even let the Bible be translated into anything other than Latin. John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was a Roman Catholic priest in Great Britain who saw, the, who saw his fellow priests and the bishops and the cardinals taking advantage of people. Taking their, taking their farms from the widows, taking large sums of money from people, ruling over them. And he knew it wasn't right. He knew the Bible. So you know what he did? He said, I'm going to translate the Bible into English so that the common man can hear what God's Word says in his own language. And he did. And you know what they did? After he died, they dug him up held a trial over his bones, found him guilty of heresy, and burned his bones. That teach him. <laughs> but they hated him. Why? Because he translated the Bible. And see, if you go into a Catholic church back then, and you hear the Bible being read in Latin, who knew Latin? The priest did, and that's it. Nobody else knew what he was saying, and nobody knew what he was and they had to do whatever they were told to do. That's the doctrine of, and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And Jesus said, I hate it. And it doesn't matter what form it comes in. Turn to, um, turn to John chapter 13. Here's the example that Jesus gave. Here's a question for you. Is... Yeah, John chapter 13, verse 4. He riseth from supper, he being Jesus, and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel there wherewith he was girded. Now, back in those days, who normally washed somebody's feet when they came in your house? The servants did. Okay. So, verse 6, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. 
Jesus saith unto him, that he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Verse 12. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye not, uh, know ye what I have done to you? Notice verse 13, 14, 15, and 16. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Who's greater than who in this church or any church? None of us are. For if I've given you an example, verse 15, that ye should do as I have done to you, verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Jesus taught not only by his words, but by his example. And he says, if I am your Lord and your master, and I'm willing to get down on my knees and wash your nasty feet, then you should be willing to do the same. And we do that here. We wash one another's feet. And we don't pick, or I don't pick, the best person in the church to wash their feet. Doesn't matter to me whose feet I wash. I'll wash anybody's feet in this church. Doesn't matter to me. I am a servant shepherd. It is my job to serve the people of this church, not be your Lord and your master. In my youth, years ago, I used to think that I was smart enough to tell everybody how to live their life. And God chastened me over that, big time. So, a couple years ago, we had a family that moved here. And I won't get into the whole story because I knew that we had laid out a fleece before the Lord whether they should move here. When they moved here, God had not done what we asked God to do to show them that they should move here. So I knew they weren't supposed to be here. They were here about six or eight months, something like that, embedded themselves in. And he came to me one Sunday afternoon in my office. And he said, Pastor, I'm having a hard time. I said, what's going on? And I kind of knew what I kind of knew what was what he was going to say. And he said, I just can't get people to listen to me because I'm trying to tell them how they're not living right and they're not listening to me. And I knew that's what he had been doing. Him and his wife and even his son, they taught it to their son. He was about 12, 13 years old. And I said, who told you it was your job to tell the people in this church how to live? You just moved here. Who told you it was your responsibility? I said, if it's anybody's responsibility, it's mine. And I said, I just don't go around telling everybody what I think they ought to be doing. If they come to me and ask me, I tell them. But other than that, I've learned to keep my mouth shut. People are going, people, we're humans. We make mistakes and usually we learn by them. And I've learned that if you just let people make a mistake when they learn from it, it's better than if I would have told them, now don't do that then they wouldn't have learned anything. They're just doing it because I told them to do it. But once we do stupid stuff and we learn we should have never done that, then we won't do it again. Amen? Who touches a hot stove? I would, I would ask you, who touches a hot plate when the waitress says, now be careful, this plate's hot. Everybody goes, ow! We all do. But we don't touch hot plates, we don't jump on the bed. We don't drink poison. We don't drink Clorox bleach. We've learned in our lifetime all the things not to do. And we learned it because we made those mistakes and God let us do it. So eventually, I asked that man and his family to leave this church because he wouldn't stop doing what he was doing. He's spreading lies everywhere about people. Well, he left here went to another church in this town and I knew the church and I knew the pastor and I thought I wonder if I should call him and I thought no I don't I, I just don't know what to do six months later he called me and he said do you know so-and-so and I said yeah he said well you know about him and I told him the story he said I'm gonna have to run him out 
He said, they're doing the same thing here. The guy told me in my office, he said, we've been asked to leave five churches already. I just don't understand it. Um, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9, I think that God has set forth us apostles last, as it were appointed to death. The apostles hold the chief office of all the human Christians. And yet... Every one of them was martyred, except John. That's what Paul was saying. I think God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. Luke 9, 48, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. So who's the greatest one in the church? The least. Remember what Jesus, how he divided the sheep from the goats? And as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And I'm with Jesus. I hate the doctrine and the deeds of the men or women who try to rule over everybody in their church thinking that they're called by God to be everybody's boss. You don't... You don't eat that food unless I approve of it. And I know some that do that. And that ain't right. Amen? So that's what that is. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. We thank you for it. We thank you, God, for teaching us, for loving us, for allowing us to make mistakes, to learn from them. And Father, we thank you, God, that while we may not agree on everything, what binds us together is our love for your word and for the blood of Jesus. Bless this word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.